What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so normally our Green Lantern videos come out on Sunday, but I forgot to record it, so we're releasing it today. Anyway, this is Black Lantern Superman, so keep in mind these videos usually come out on Sundays, today's a special exception, but this is, again, part of the events of Blackest Night. Now remember, Blackest Night happens over the course of one night, but it's like the whole world's going to pot over the course of a single night, like everything's beginning to go nuts. Now again, the purpose of these tie-ins is to answer the question, what were all the other superheroes doing when these mysterious Black Lantern rings just started descending on the planet earth now remember this is all part of that whole concept of the war of light the idea that you have the green lanterns you have the guardians of the universe you have you know all these other lantern cores that are out there and there's this prophecy called blackest night and that all these different lantern cores will basically make their presence known they will step out into the light the sinestro core the green lantern core the indigo core the star sapphires the black lanterns they will all basically step out into the light for everybody to see them and they will end up engaging in this massive war at the same time, the Black Lantern Corps will rise. And because of the fact that they will basically kill everybody, the emotional spectrum will cease to exist, everything in the universe will die, it's literally end times. It's the apocalypse in the DC universe. It's about as dark as it gets. But on the whole, when Blackest Night first kicked off, all we knew is that there were Black Lantern rings. Now, putting two and two together, we could figure out that because of the fact that the Black Lantern rings were basically binding themselves to superheroes who were already dead, the Black Lantern rings were basically bringing the dead back to life. But as we went through that story, what we started to realize is that there's a difference between animating a body and animating a spirit. And that for the most part, these are not tried and true superheroes the way they were before. Yes, all their powers are still intact, but at the end of the day, they're not reanimated in the traditional sense. They're just corpses that are essentially running around. Now, what this does is it ties into Black Lantern Superman. And it's one of the most intriguing things about this. The reason being is because what we end up doing is we end up picking up with post-crisis Superman and Superboy. Now, here's something that I want to talk about here, because while this story is mostly just fighting, there's a lot of history here, and that's the really cool thing about this. So, every video is someone's first video, we're going to treat it that way. In DC Comics, you've had, you have crises, and you have the multiverse, and that's it. 1961, the multiverse was invented. 1985, Crisis on Infinite Earths killed it off. 2006, Infinite Crisis brought the multiverse back, but it was not the same as the original. It was just a little bit different. Final Crisis made the superheroes aware of it. The multiverse and the crisis summed up in 10 seconds. That's basically what it is. Now, with regards to this Black Lantern version of Superman, this is Earth 2 Superman. This is where things get a little hairy. This is basically 1930s, 1940s Superman, as he existed before 1956. And the reason why is because, you know, with the Flash of Two Worlds, DC introduced the multiverse, right? You know, they said, hey, there's all these multiple universes that exist out there. And it was designed for the purpose of answering questions why it is that, like, the original Flash, Jay Garrick, had vanished and was replaced by Barry Allen with no real explanation. People didn't know where he came from. People didn't know what was going on. DC said, okay, in 1961, here's the multiverse. What really goes on here is that ever since Barry Allen was introduced in 1956, you have been reading about a universe called Earth One. We just never told you about it. But if you were reading comics back during the 1940s, you were reading a line of comics called Earth Two. We just didn't tell you they switched anywhere along the line. Now, in truth, DC just made it up on the spot. It was just a way to reconcile these two things together. But this this version of Superman, this original 1930s Golden Age Superman from Action Comics number one, he existed in the Earth 2 line of comics for years and years and years and years. In 1985, because DC was getting rid of the multiverse, you couldn't have two Supermen running around, one of whom was from a universe that was not supposed to exist after Crisis on Infinite Earths. And so what they did is they took this version of Superman and his wife Lois Lane and they just ushered him off to a paradise dimension. That was it. It was supposed to be heaven. It was just supposed to be Crisis on Infinite Earths ended. They basically went to heaven and that was it. That was really all there was to it. Fast forward to Infinite Crisis in 2005, 2006. And what DC ended up doing is they basically brought back this original Golden Age Superman and his wife Lois Lane. Now, this goes into the whole Infinite Crisis story. You'll find that down in the description. We're not going to rehash Infinite Crisis. If you want to know about it, watch the video. <laughs> but in that event, it was basically Superboy Prime, one of the most popular, albeit one of the most polarizing villains in DC's history, facing off against all the superheroes and just wrecking them handedly. It, it really wasn't even a contest for the most part. But in that story, this 
Earth 2 Golden Age Superman died. He officially was killed off. And that's why he's a Black Lantern. Is because he's been dead ever since the events of Infinite Crisis. That's why he's back here. Now, he was given a proper burial by the modern Superman. You know, by the post-crisis Superman, if we want to call him that. He was given an actual burial. He was, you know, buried next to the Kents, different things like, or at least next to Jonathan Kent. And the result is that he just kind of was, you know, remembered. That was essentially it. But him popping back up here as a Black Lantern puts us in a precarious situation. Because remember, despite the fact that these are not really the original superheroes wearing Black Lantern rings, they do have all their powers. And so this is basically a Black Lantern Superman. Now, Golden Age Superman, the way he existed back during the 1930s and 1940s, was pretty weak in comparison to like his post-crisis counterpart. But as the years progressed, going into, again, Crisis on Infinite Earths, his power became more and more intense because it didn't make any sense for DC to cross over Earth-1 and Earth-2 if Earth-2 Superman couldn't keep up with Earth-1 Superman. And so his powers began to grow, his powers began to expand within reason he was always the weakest of the two but when infinite crisis came around he was powerful like he was i would argue as powerful as post-crisis superman so it's not like the black lantern version of the superman who couldn't fly and who was only so strong this guy can do everything superman can do and that's what makes him so dangerous but what this also does is it brings into the equation connor kent now connor kent is one of those characters that fans adore they absolutely love him it is <laughs> it's crazy people love of Connor Kent, but he is basically Superboy from the death of Superman. In the early 1990s, DC was trying to find a way to make Superman more relevant because he'd been falling out in popularity since the 1970s. And so because of that, what they ended up doing is they ended up killing him off. Well, in the time between Superman dying and Superman returning, we got a story called Reign of the Superman, and we got four different versions of Superman. We got the Eradicator, we got Cyborg, we got Steel, and we got Superboy. Now, the problem was after Superman returned and this kid who basically looked like Bret Hart from the WWE, nobody knew what to do with him. So what they ended up doing was just kind of shuffling him around and moving him around. Now, he really hit his stride when I believe it was Teen Titans, but regardless, like that was when he really seemed to like elevate to the point of popularity because DC gave him a purpose. But his whole origin is tied into the idea that following the death of Superman, Lex Luthor had basically taken his own genes, modified them, and combined them with Superman genes to create this character. And that's really the legacy that he's always lived with. He's basically a clone of Superman and Lex Luthor combined into one. Now, the reason why this matters is because this is the entire basis behind his stance in this story. And the reason for that is because, again, you know, with the idea of Black Lantern Lois Lane chasing down Martha Kent, which isn't really that relevant, but it's a thing that happens, we end up being met with the arrival of Psycho Pirate. Now, Psycho Pirate is a really, really cool villain because Psycho Pirate's basically a guy who can manipulate the emotions of others. It's to basically say, like, you, you're terrified, aren't you? Like, aren't you so scared? of everything and then people will just start freaking out they'll just start losing their minds now it's not a power inherent to psycho pirate right like it's not like he has telepathy or telekinesis he uses what's called the medusa's mask and anybody who wields the medusa's mask can do what psycho pirate can do he's a little more like impactful because of his history you know with dealing with minds and different things like that but anybody that wears medusa's mask can have the same effect in this instance because of the fact that connor kent has basically lived his life as a clone of Superman and Lex Luthor, the manipulations of Psycho Pirate bring those emotions out. It basically amplifies the existing feelings of Connor Kent with regards to the fact that he feels like he will never be as good as Superman. And that is huge because it's basically DC having, you know, Connor Kent just pour out all of his emotions to the world. Now for the average reader, people who are reading comics at the time, this was already an existing concept. It was already something that people were for the most part aware of in the sense that that was the basis of his character. Struggling to find a place as Superman Superboy in a world where everyone idolizes Superman. So because of that, it is an interesting scenario because remember, the Black Lantern Corps basically consumes the hearts of individuals, but only after just pumping them full of emotion. And so in this instance, you basically have Psycho Pirate manipulating the emotions of everybody around them. That's one of the reasons why I would argue that when it comes to the Black Lanterns and the purpose they serve, Psycho Pirate's among the most powerful because the purpose of the Black Lantern is to charge individuals with hate rage and with greed and with 
all of these different emotions so that their hearts literally just begin to fill up with emotional energy. And when that happens, the Black Lanterns kill that person and consume their heart, which in turn charges the central power battery of the Black Lantern Corps, the source of their energy. So again, it's really, really cool the way this unfolds. But what I want to do is I want to sidetrack from this fight between, you know, Connor Kent and Superman, and I actually want to focus on Supergirl. Now, this is actually a really interesting scenario. And the reason why is because this is actually Kara zor Supergirl. Now, a little more history here. When it comes to the character of Supergirl, there is the original Supergirl, Kara zor who appeared back in the Silver Age of Comics. She was in as a backup feature for Superman. I think it was for 10 years. And then she got her own series in Adventure Comics. But the idea is that the original Kara zor was basically another survivor of Krypton. Now, of course, her being one of the most popular versions of the Supergirl character, probably the most popular version of the Supergirl character, spanned for years and years and years and years. The problem with this, and one of the coolest things about it, was that the question always was debated among fans, who's stronger, Supergirl or Superman? Well, this question was finally answered in Crisis on Infinite Earths, but it was really more of like a circumstantial situation. It was the Anti-Monitor trying to obliterate everything in existence. And where all the superheroes went off against him and almost all the superheroes fell, Kara zor was basically the last one standing. And so people looked at that and said, if she's the last one standing and she's the only one that can really hurt the Anti-Monitor, well, then it stands to reason that she's more powerful than Superman. That was basically the indication that was given. Now, of course, uh, the fact that she died during Crisis on Infinite Earths was massive because DC was going back to the status quo. The idea was that Superman was the last son of Krypton. And despite how many fans Supergirl had, at the end of the day, she was not as popular as Superman. And if DC was going to use Crisis on Infinite Earths to go back to the status quo, then that meant every other version of a Kryptonian, anyone who was not Superman, had to die. And that's what happened. The Superboy stories went back to retelling the origin of Superman when he was younger. Superman himself was the only survivor of Krypton. Now, because Supergirl was so popular, DC tried to reinvent her. And they basically created a character named Linda Danvers, who I believe operated as like Matrix or something like that. And it was this weird cyborg thing from like another dimension. Most people didn't like her. And so in 2001, DC came up with this genius idea to basically create this story where Linda Danvers met Kara zor -El. And it was cool because it was basically this scenario where Linda Danvers tried to save Kara zor during Crisis on Infinite Earths and it didn't work. Basically, it sent Linda Danvers into this mental crisis where she just couldn't handle her failure and essentially just gave up. This went into 2004 with a story by Jeff Loeb called Supergirl Many Happy Returns and it was in the existing Supergirl story but it was designed to wrap it up. It was issue 75 through 80. And so what they ended up doing was they basically relaunched the Supergirl story starring Kara zor -El. and that's why she's here. The problem the problem with this is that DC had to find a way to reconcile her original origin with the way that she's here now. And so what they ended up doing is they ended up going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, so yeah, Argo City's still there. Like she's still a survivor of Krypton. Her father, you know, zor was the one that saved her. Her mother, Allura, was there along the way. Little changes were made. Like her father wasn't a scientist, different things like that. But in order to rectify why it is we'd never heard of Argo City before now, DC said, okay, so along the lines, the villain Brainiac showed up and not only did he bottle the Kryptonian city of Kandor, he took the city of Argo and merged it with Kandor and put them in a bottle. And that's why we haven't seen them yet because nobody knew it was there. And so because of that, this allowed Kara zor to basically reunite with her parents. Now, it doesn't really matter anyway because her dad ended up getting killed, but her mom remained in Kandor. Again, it's the inability to regrow those cities back to their normal size that make them so interesting. But the reason this matters is because with the death of her father, a Black Lantern ring crash lands inside of Argo City slash Kandor. And what ends up happening here is her father reanimates as a Black Lantern. And so we basically have two conflicts going on at the same time. There is post-crisis Superman facing off against classic Superman. And then there is uh, Supergirl facing off against her dad. And it creates some pretty interesting moral quandaries because what we end up having here is this idea that not only did Supergirl's father die, he's basically reanimated and they're faced with a choice that he's going to have to die again, this time at the hands of Kara herself. And so it's really, really cool because we also have this really cool moment with like Martha Kent where she basically is trying to fend off against Black Lantern Lois Lane but it's also the idea that Black Lantern Lois Lane makes a statement of hey my ring is what keeps me alive you can't kill me unless you take my ring away is basically a way for Martha Kent to know what's going on it's just kind of a plot device and so what ends up happening is Crypto the dog <laughs> the Kryptonian dog actually you know attacks uh, Black Lantern Lois Lane bites her hand off and when she's separated from her ring gets totally incinerated Black Lantern Lois Lane is now gone out of the 
the equation again. But jumping back over to Supergirl and jumping back over to the battle, but you know, with her and Superman, it's really interesting to see this because it's her basically facing off against her dad. That's really about it. Having to go through and kill them also reconciles with Superman himself facing off against Black Lantern Superman. Now, ultimately, he's defeated. Like, he's basically taken out by Connor Kent himself. It really kind of gives Connor Kent his moment in the sun in the sense that, sure, he is a carbon copy of Superman, but it doesn't take away from how awesome he is. Everybody's had that mantle they have to live up to, right? If it's like a brother or a sister, or like a dad or a mom, you know, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you know, whatever the case is, they have to live up to what they feel are impossible standards. And so again, it hit a lot of people home when it came to the character of Connor Kent because they've all been down in that position before. Now, ultimately, again, with the character of Supergirl's father, he's just kind of locked out, you know, in the sense that he's stripped of his hand, you know, with his ring. And that's really it. You know, I mean, he's just kind of stuck out there and there's really nothing more to do. He just kind of goes back, to, you know, to being inanimate. They're the same thing with Earth 2 Superman. But again, that's the purpose of this is to basically say, OK, guys, so there are some characters who come back as Black Lanterns. Some of them die, but some of them don't. And that's the purpose. This was basically a reboot for DC in a lot of different ways. It's a way for DC to basically say, OK, so like every superhero and every supervillain who's ever died is going to come back to life. And then we're going to figure out what we're going to do with them after that. We're basically going to throw all the pieces on the board. We're going to keep the ones we want and we're going to get rid of the ones that we don't. And that's what Brightest Day does. Again, it's pretty cool. It's pretty ingenious in terms of how it's done. But this is also one of my favorite stories when it comes to Superman. So with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.